Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this dialogue on sustainability and scalability of free software projects. My name is Carol Romero. I'm part of the product team at the CDIM, and I'll be hosting this conversation with three great guests where, where we are going to talk about an old classic in the open source uh, universe. I believe that in almost any tech conference, there is always a, a session or even a whole track on how can we scale and maintain uh, Floss projects. And, uh, and the truth is that after uh, more than three decades, this still remains a challenge for most uh, open source initiatives and their communities. And here at the CDIM, being still a quite young project with only four years in the making, we have started to ask ourselves uh, some questions on this subject, and we thought that this conference, the Stream Fest, was the perfect time to connect and talk to people from other projects who have more experience uh, on dealing with these issues. So um, we, uh, we're going to start with two short talks uh, from the projects that we have invited. They are the Foundation for Public Code and the GT Video Conference uh, platform. And after that, uh, we'll have a discussion with our speakers on some of the challenges that we see at the CDIM when we think, for example, about scaling up our community or uh, becoming sustainable in the long run. Of course, uh, we'll also have some room for your questions. So if you're just tuning in and you want to participate, you can do it uh, using the, the link in this, uh, below this video in the description, or if you're already watching us from MetaDecidim, just uh, submit your questions uh, through the comments section. All right, uh, let's go with our first speaker. Her name is Alba Roza from the Foundation for Public Code. She's a developer relations professional who has been working in tech communication and marketing since 2011. And in the last six years, Alba has specialized in supporting software communities. And at the foundation, she, actually, she uh, now works as a code based steward. Welcome, Alba. It's really great to have you here. Thank you, Carl. Uh, likewise, I'm super happy to be here and you know surrounded by by this group of professionals. Super happy to have this conversation today. So uh, I presented you, Alba, as a code-based steward, and I think it would be great to start by knowing um, what code-based stewardship means and what is the personal work that you do at the foundation. And yeah. also, just just in in order to open a little bit the the top the today's topic, uh, I ask you, what does sustainability means to you when it comes to open source projects? That's it. So, can I hijack the screen? Okay. I think so, let's do it then. Yeah. Okay, I think you're seeing everything I'm seeing. <laughs> Let's start with it. Yeah, so um, I've put together <clears throat> this slides um, to talk about yeah, sustainability and also scalability in in code bases that we usually work with in the in the Foundation for Public Code. Uh, but before starting to talk about this, I would like to uh, talk about what public code means, right? So uh, for us, public code, is, public code is when the software implements policy that is both produced by and for the public. So that's what we call public code. And um, in the foundation for public code, uh, since I'm assuming most of the audience that is today out there is uh, very familiar with open source projects and open source communities, in the foundation, we basically support public organizations by storing open source code bases. That's it in a nutshell. And uh, related to my job, my uh, role, uh, I'm a code base steward, as you said. And uh, this means basically that uh, my, my specialty areas are both uh, building community and also uh, product marketing. And uh, I'm here today to talk about yeah what we've learned so far 
from the stewardship uh, team in both sustainability and scalability. So uh, in order to give this a little bit of uh, structure, I'm going to say that uh, I've put together uh, eight specific risks for uh, public sector code bases that I'm going to briefly go over them. And besides that, that besides that, I've also, uh, I'm also going to briefly talk about best practices for uh, strengthened communities in general. So um, let's start without further ado uh, with the specific risks for public sector code bases. So um, the first one I would like to, to stop in is, of course, economic risk, right? Um, everything related to the changes to budget. This is a special risk for, for public code. Um, if, you know, if public, or if public organizations are not budgeting appropriately for maintenance or uh, further development of an existing code base. Another one would be a political one. So let's think, for instance, of a change of government. Uh, and let's think that it can happen that incoming governments, they are often tempted to cancel work by the previous administration. So if we expand the community through uh, to have a, a bunch of geographic areas, uh, that's how we're going to ensure and that's, that's how we're going to get a truly internationally sustainable code base. Uh, policy changes, of course, that this could be, for example, a, a due to a change in risk appetite, uh, a procurement policy that changes, or even a industrial policy, right? This is why we need a clear governance structure in this code basis, and <clears throat> we also need to build deep understanding and support for using open source within a public organization. The fourth if I'm not mistaken, risk that we may, may encounter is uh, over-reliance on one vendor. Let's say that there's a big risk that uh, a public sector market isn't big enough to justify vendors joining a code-based community. Uh, there, let's think that there aren't enough uh, potential customers for the vendor to build a business model around that code base. Um, we also, the, the risk of, for, the, for this code base, uh, then it's over-reliance on one vendor, right? So building public code bases to scale internationally from the start increases the size of the potential market. And we are also in contact with uh, a community uh, in the Foundation for Public Code that even before starting developing the project, uh, they keep this in mind and they um, they study if, you know, if it's gonna be feasible or not, depending on the ecosystem the, the, that this code base is gonna have in the future. A following risk would be also the bus factor, uh, a very known one, a problem in, in, in case someone gets hit by a bus. It's a, it's a common one in the open source communities. And this would be over-reliance on too few people, right? If, um, yeah, if that happens. So documentation and also pur purposefully inviting people in to participate more deeply in the community would allow us to, you know, mentor to build the following generation of, of leaders in that community. And um, engineering guidelines, of course, we have to keep them in mind. And when I say engineering guidelines, I'm, I mean, for instance, if you plan to scale, we from the Foundation for Public Code prefer set-based APIs instead of a uh, of individual item or even individual object APIs. Uh, this will allow the code base to handle larger amounts of, of uh, throughput as it increases, increases in popularity, right? So this is basically a design choice we encourage you to make on um, early base, uh, early on ba based on your ambitions. Because, or let's think, I don't know, let's put an example here, for instance, if you want to optimize calls to a database, right? If you know that it's going to be a recurrent thing that is going to happen in your project or in your code base over and over again, well, maybe it's more intelligent if you start thinking beforehand how to deal with that problem in order to make it more efficient for, for the code base. And um, 
What do I mean by code bases working practices that can scale? Well, we believe that it might be more efficient for some purposes <clears throat> to work with smaller teams. For instance, uh, a decision making. We, in the Foundation for Public Code, uh, we are trying to implement it in the code base we steward throughout the, um, I think we call the, the steering groups. And right now we're using, for instance, we have the technical steering group, we have uh, the product steering group, also communication steering group. And <clears throat> in these meetings, um, joining is optional, by the way, by the rest of the community. And um, yeah, this is a, a simpler way and faster way of, of making decisions, right? And this is the last one, and I'm about to, to finish, I promise. Uh, <laughs> this is the eighth uh, risk that we detect, and it's, of course, the lack of knowledge of uh, the public sector, right? You have to understand the system you're working in in order to uh, survive it. <laughs> That's clear. And um, after these eight risks that we usually detect from the, from the code base team, there are also some other, well, I would like, first of all, to, to stop by something that we personally feel very proud of, and it's this, uh, this success story from the OpenSAC market, market consultation. Um, OpenSAC is a code base that we've been working with for, the, so for several months, let's say. And uh, if you go to our blog, uh, blog.publiccode.net, uh, there's an entry that is supposed uh, written by our colleague Felix, and he explains in there the lessons learned for how to build a public organization or vendor community from scratch. So if you're actually looking for more concrete tips or more specific tips to avoid these risks or to prevent these risks or, or challenges when growing, uh, I strongly recommend visiting this uh, article written by, by Felix. And yeah, to wrap it up, I've been going through like more specific public code communities guidelines, but of course, these communities, they belong to a the, the world of communities, right? There are several communities, uh, a lot of communities out there, not 100%, not all of them, of course, involved with public code. So there are like some obvious things that you would uh, recommend for uh, thriving your uh, a community that, I don't know, would be, for instance, uh, building a, a authentic relationships with the rest of the members. So, and also by building authentic relationships and providing uh, people with a value or sentimental, sentimental value, or, you know, this joint feeling of doing stuff all together. That would also, for instance, detect and prevent burnout, which is something that it's super common in open source communities. Uh, I don't know, you can also use uh, the reward ambassador program. So by doing that, you would put the community in the spotlight. Um, I would recommend, I don't know, uh, providing uh, value at the beginning, a lot of value, a lot of documents, a lot of work instead of, you know, looking for maybe protagonism that, that some members might might look from, from the beginning. I don't know. And also learning, being very humble and learning also from other communities, right? So. I don't know, not only participating in their communities, but also be part of other communities. That's also super helpful. And uh, and also very specific for, for public code or public environment communities, I would strongly recommend to keep in mind that things go slower than in other sectors or other industries. So keep in mind this small pace and uh, not try to overstep. And uh, I don't know, as a last one, I would also say, for instance, that it's interesting if you provide the community with the journey, with your pipeline beforehand, so they know what to expect and what to look up to, right? I don't know, these are some, just a few, a bunch of, of tips. And, um, and other tips that uh, maybe you can use for your um, community? Well, so these are... Um, several reports that uh, I've uh, that came to my mind related to this topic we've been talking about. So for instance, New America, they have a report named Building and Reusing Open Source Tools Government. And um, I would strongly recommend that if you're a manager, for instance, to get to know what things can you expect and avoid. And uh, for instance, also, uh, they also have uh, this guideline for creating sustainable open source communities that uh, I would recommend more maybe to policy tech people. And um, 
of course, uh, this is like a personal, very personal one. I, I've encountered, I, I've came across uh, with uh, Mark, Mark Head's uh, guide. He has a guide called uh, How to Talk to Civic, Serv Civic Hackers, sorry. And uh, I found it very, very insightful. So I would also recommend that for everyone, more general uh, civil servants, maybe. And uh, of course, I can't finish this talk without recommending um, the jewel of the crown of our very own Foundation for Public Code. And this is the, the Standard for Public Code. Uh, you have the link down there. So uh, you can access standard.publiccode.net. Standard for Public Code is how we ensure sustainability in code bases from the Foundation for Public Code. This is basically a set of cert cert uh, certification criteria. Sorry, there are 15 right now. And we use it to audit other code bases and uh, contributions. And um, yeah, and it's of course collaboratively defined and continuously versioned. We've, we've created this, we've put up the, this standard with the help or the support of the rest of the community. But yeah, uh, if you go through the criterion, you'll find some recommendations to avoid these risks and challenges to walk through uh, towards sustainability. Like for instance, I don't know, use plain English or I don't know, welcome contributors, right? Like how to do that. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Alba. I think that you perfectly highlighted uh, almost every risk that any open source projects uh, faces in terms of uh, sustainability. And thank you also for the great tips that you gave us. I hope we can have uh, some time in the Q&A session to comment on that. But now it's turn for our friends of the GT project. We have with us um, Jaya Alamsetti. She is a senior software engineer uh, on the JIT team with a decade of experience uh, developing video conference so software. Uh, welcome, Jaya, and good morning to you. Thanks, Carol. Um, hello, everyone. And a special thanks because I know it's quite early right now in the States. Uh, I hope you at least had time to grab some coffee or something. And uh, with Jaya is also Saul Ibarra. Saul works uh, on GT at 8x8 and it's the self-appointed chief GT evangelist. Welcome, Saul. Saul. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having us. Really a pleasure to be here. And let me tell you, Saul, that as an evangelist, uh, I'm afraid you're preaching to the choir here because <laughs> As you can see, you, we're using uh, GT to run our conference. We were already big fans of the project before the pandemic came in. But of course, since then, GT has become a critical infrastructure, not only for us, but for many people uh, around the world. So I believe you're going to tell us more about what is GT, what do you do there? But it would be really awesome also to hear that story about how did you go from having a few hundreds of thousands monthly active users to a few million in less than, than a year. Yeah, it's pretty cool to hear that you were using it, that you were using it before. I used that title to start with a joke that always works. Uh, and today, Jay is going to tell you all about how we uh, scaled up and then um, hopefully we'll do some interesting questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm so pretty excited. Uh, so let me start my slides here. And yeah, let me turn on my camera now. Yeah, I guess you're all able to see me. So yeah, so thanks everyone. Uh, and thanks Carol for having us here. So uh, my name is Jalen Seri, like, and uh, I am a Jitsi developer, and I joined Jitsi just over a year ago. And here I am today talking about what Jitsi is, how it's used, and uh, what kind of challenges we faced in scaling our service to meet the surge in demand due to the pandemic, like in the last few months. So. So Jitsi is a set of open source projects that allows you to easily build and deploy feature rich and secure video conferencing solutions. Like it runs in the browser and you don't need any downloads and it's based on uh, WebRTC, which is an open framework that enables real time communication capabilities in the browser. So, um, 
currently, like there are three ways in which people use Jitsi, like the meet .si or 8x8 VC service that we provide for free, like this conference right now is hosted on 8x8 VC. And then uh, people can actually uh, use their own or someone else's uh, self-hosted instance. Like we make it really easy to build and deploy your own instance. Like there is a ton of information out there on how to do it. And uh, we have a very helpful community of users uh, who, uh, who can guide you. And uh, you can even find a YouTube tutorial about installing Jitsi on a Raspberry Pi. So it's like, it's how simple it is. And then, like, we have a third uh, option for those who want to be able to quickly embed uh, video conferencing into their applications, but do not want the burden of maintaining their own infrastructure. So for them, we offer Jitsi as a service, as an alternative where we take the responsibility of maintaining the infrastructure for them. And uh, let's move on to, uh, like, we want to talk about what happened in the spring, right? Like the spring deluge. So like at the onset of the pandemic, like as more and more countries were going into lockdown, we started to see a surge in the traffic. Like we started seeing double the traffic we were seeing the day before. And, and this was happening every single day and it lasted for weeks. So not only this was like unprecedented for us, but it's also usually really hard. Like to deal with such a sustained change in usage without a massive re-engineering effort. So if you want to talk numbers, like you have the numbers here, like we had 60 times more conferences, 300 times more participants and 180 times more traffic. So before the pandemic, we were like managing service by the tens and it quickly escalated to like the thousands at the peak. And yeah, the numbers are very crazy, but that's how it was. So, but we had something that like people really needed in those times and we were fortunate enough to have the backing of uh, 8x8 VC and we got down to work and it was all hands on deck like for weeks. So uh, let's take a sneak peek of what our infrastructure looks like and how we handled all that traffic. So at the time, like we ran all our infrastructure on AWS. I mean, I don't want to go into all the details about uh, trying to explain what each and every component is. But what I wanted to highlight here is that we had a globally distributed and horizontally scalable infrastructure that was like spread across uh, multiple regions in the AWS cloud. So we had this ability to stand up a region and dynamically like route the traffic whenever and wherever it was needed. So like as an example, like in the midst of the crisis, we had to quickly deploy the Paris region uh, to handle the sur surge in the traffic that we were seeing in the Central Europe to keep the la uh, latency low. So what I wanted to emphasize is uh, that we had a solid foundation to begin with, but that doesn't mean we didn't have any issues. Like, yes, we had problems, like many of them and on, on each and every component. Uh, though we didn't need any major re-engineering, but it, but what we had to do was like mostly removing bottlenecks through configuration and uh, making our own software more resilient under heavy load. Like some of the problems that we ran into were like uh, ephemeral port exhaustion, like we were hitting file descriptor limits and then some of the modules uh, that we had in our signaling server was suboptimal. So, but what, happened is like we've had this infrastructure in place for about five years now we haven't changed it a bit but then what the pandemic has like i mean what it has done is it it has like this infrastructure has probably proved itself like hats off to our developers uh and the devops team especially and uh, we couldn't have done it otherwise and uh Something that we also did during the summer break was to like move all our media nodes out of AWS and uh, into the Oracle cloud, like as a cost optimizing measure. So for those of you uh, who already have used uh, AWS, you probably know that bandwidth can get uh, really expensive over there. And not only that, like uh, we are uh, multi-cloud ready now and we could potentially leverage the other infrastructures like uh, in the infrastructure providers uh, in the future. And uh, there was another feature that we implemented that we call uh, off-stage layer suspension. So what we do here is like uh, we dynamically adjust the resolution of a video a user sends, depending on how that uh, user is being viewed by other participants in the call. Like 
let's say you're in a large meeting and then you're using tile view and no one is viewing you at a resolution like greater than uh, 180p then why waste cpu and send hd and uh, sd resolutions right so this is when uh, layer suspension kicks in and um, we stop sending uh, sd and hd resolutions and this saves cpu and bandwidth on the clients and thereby improving performance and then that also reduces uh, the processing power that's needed on uh, per participant uh, basis on uh, on the bridges that are in our infrastructure. So that was about load, but let's talk about usability. Like while we were trying to keep our service afloat, we had a ton of all these first time users who were like trying to use in ways that we didn't envision and and some of the features that were uh, features were not being discovered because they were not obvious to them and so we did have like usability and we also had to make a client ubiquitous so that it could run everywhere like we did an overhaul of our uh, Firefox support for all the privacy-minded uh, users because it was a big deal for them. And uh, we also added support for like Safari and mobile browsers. And uh, based on all the feedback that we received from the Jitsi community, like through the numerous channels, like we developed and uh, launched uh, many uh, small and big features that uh, improved the usability of our product. So let's take a look at uh, what those changes are. So this is an easy one, uh, easy win. Like uh, we had all these first time users who were probably used to all these messaging services that had some kind of a contact list. And they were uh, confused as to how you could invite other people into the meetings, like when they were using Jetsy. So, this is something that you don't think of when you're using your product every day. But yeah, we got the feedback loud and clear that it was not obvious. So, so we made it easier and more obvious to uh, share the meeting information. We have this uh, a button here. You click on it, and then yeah, you you see all the different options for uh, sharing this information. You see all the different channels that you could use for uh, sharing the meeting information with other people in the conference. And then uh, there's this is another feature. I mean, we added a new pre-join screen uh, where you can actually choose your devices and test them before you uh, join a meeting. Like you don't have to be worried about like weird camera angles or like your mic not working before you land into a room full of users, right? You don't want to troubleshoot your device issues once you're there. So, and then, um, as our uh, user base grew, so did the views like, we were receiving a lot of complaints and so we worked on uh, adding a number of measures to uh, make sure people can have their meetings safely so so for example this is like uh, something very simple but highly efficient like when you uh, select a meeting name uh, you, a room for your name uh, we actually make it so so we'll show a warning if uh, that name is easy to guess and this way you know that you should probably use a password or enable the lobby and uh, keep the bad guys out so this was a very uh, simple but effective uh, feature and uh, speaking of which we have this new uh, feature called lobby uh, this is like a security mechanism that we have in place uh, to prevent uninvited users from en entering the conference like once you enable it, like the moderator of the room will get a notification about users who are waiting in the lobby and they can uh, enter only once they're approved. So, and yeah, I think, yeah, let me, yeah, I have to pick up a pace pick up my pace now. So we've also actually uh, grouped all the security options in a security dialog to make it a one-stop shop for all things uh, security. That's like, we have this uh, new shield icon at the bottom of the conference. When you click on it, you have your uh, uh, all the options to uh, like enable lobby or add a password for your conference or enable end-to-end -end, end -end encryption. And speaking of this, yeah, this is the new exciting feature that we've been working on recently. Like we are already on our uh, second uh, iteration of the implementation. Like this is an extra layer of encryption. Uh, WebRTC actually already encrypts all the streams with like DTLS SRTP, 
but we add another layer of uh, encryption over that. So uh, we use insertable streams like that allows uh, developers to access uh, to have access to the raw audio and video frames as they come in and before they get sent out. So what we do is like we encrypt the frames as they go out from the browser and then we decrypt as they come into the to the receiver. So I think there's like, yeah, there's so much to talk about, but it looks like I'm, um, yeah, I'm a little out of time here. So I'm gonna wrap up uh, with, wrap up this presentation with this picture. Like this year picture is worth a thousand words and I couldn't have chosen a better one. So this was sent to us uh, by the staff of a hospital in Italy. Like these are the people who were like at the front lines battling this deadly virus and yet, uh, they took out the time to uh, let us know how much they appreciated us and how we were able to help them keep their patients connected with their loved ones. Like, it makes it all worth it. Like, this is what makes Jitsi so special, right? Like, it's not every day that we get the chance to have such a positive impact in the world. Um, so I would like to uh, wrap up on this positive note. And thanks for the time. Um, back to you, Carol. Thank you so much, uh, Jaya. It's been a wonderful presentation, and I think it's very moving uh, that you ended with this slide. And I guess that when you see these kind of uh, grateful responses, all of a sudden your work uh, makes totally sense, right? Yeah. And, and and I think it's very impressive, uh, impressive the work that you've done in such a short uh, period of time. So congratulations for that. Uh, we'll be discovering um, the exciting new features of uh, Jitsi. So um, let's go uh, with the questions that we have prepared. And I'm going to start uh, with something related to what Jaya mentioned in her presentation. And this is about um, the, the, the explosion growth that you experimented in the project. And you talked about um, how did you need to increase the infrastructure layer to give response to the high demand. But what about um, the organizational layer how do you handle uh, when you have this exponential growth um, practically overnight? And I'm thinking about um, hiring more people, using other resources beyond the logistics of more data centers or infrastructure. What do you think on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, yeah, it's, we had actually we we were the same set of engineers i mean yeah it was crazy and maybe Saul will talk more about it but yeah we managed it with the same set of resource uh, uh the, the teams remained the same yeah maybe Saul can take on and then he talk about what other changes uh, we had to do in the, at the organizational level yeah i think it's hard to so the interesting thing was that of course because this happens overnight you can't plan for it so you just take it as it comes. And what I think the, the critical part, well, it was a number of parts, but first of all, organizationally, uh, you need to detect uh, that you need to do something about it. So uh, our organization decided that this was a good fight worth fighting, like helping with with our with our work was something that we could do to have a positive impact in you know, in the situation at hand. So that meant drop everything else you're doing um, and you do this now. And everybody's brain was set to work on this task, right? And you may be working on mobile, you may be working on the web, you may be working on the infrastructure side of things. It doesn't really matter because everybody has some ideas or has some stuff that, that you know, that can add in the end. And it was this collective hive mind that helped us remove all the bottlenecks along the way until we could make it scale. And of course, the second part to that is that um, sometimes you need to throw money at the problem, or in this case, hardware, which you buy with money. Uh, so someone needs to open up their wallet and use that um, you know, VC money, I guess, 
and spend it in something good. So in this case, it was paying the AWS bill. And we even had an interesting happenstance there. Like we tweeted as a joke uh, to the Amazon CTO is like, hey, uh, can you take this one for us? <laughs> and suddenly out of nowhere, um, Amazon's DevRel gets in touch with us. We have a meeting. Um, they say, we're going to work out a deal with you folks. Um, they, they wanted to actually publish some guides on helping people deploy uh, Jitsi for their own, uh, you know, for their own organizations. Um, and, and I collaborated personally with them to, to write the part for containerizing on, on AWS. So suddenly, serendipitously, these things happen, right? So it was the same amount of engineers as before. It's just handling 300 times, uh, sorry, 300 times more people. Uh, but as Jaya pointed out, we had a solid foundation. So we just needed to iron out some of the kinks and then we were off to the races. And right now, after all the optimizations that we've done, we can handle, uh, we're handling uh, less of the load as before, but we have like one quarter of the infrastructure. Um, so, you know, we, we could, like it, it took us a little bit to, of course, uh, um, optimize all of that down. But as she said, it's, it was totally worth it. And um, I've also mentioned that uh, open source burnout is is something. And you know, we took turns at being burned out. It was just impossible otherwise. Uh, but but in the end, it's like this like this image with these doctors and all the overwhelmingly positive feedback is what gives you fuel to to continue for the next day, you know, and in the end it was, until we got it under control, um, we, we did whatever it took. Wow, I was just going to ask um, if, if we could have some set of indicators that tell us that things are starting going out of control, but I see that in your case, there was no way to foresee what was uh, coming. Um, and we tried to prevent some of it, like when when we, you know, when you when you hear in the news, oh, uh, France is or Italy is closing all the schools on Monday. You know, Monday is going to be hell. Hmm. Um, but the interesting thing on the technical level is that you've never seen those traffic patterns. Like it's it's one thing to have I don't know how many thousands of simultaneous users. That's something, but it's something else to have thousands of simultaneous users all connecting at 9 a.m. at the same time. Uh, so that is, it, it looks similar, but it's not. So, uh, and this is really what it's very hard to, 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 to think about. We reached unprecedented scale levels for ourselves, uh, but not only us, right? So you, you saw Netflix uh, cutting on quality, um, Zoom as well. So it, it's like this was a worldwide, everybody's scrambling, trying to, you know, patch up fire. Like you're like a firefighter trying to put out every, some fires every day. Um, and I think everybody was on a similar, on a similar boat. Um, you know, we have a cool story to tell because it's a small open source project that suddenly became somewhat more well known. Um, but I think many more people were in a similar, in a similar situation. And we are thankful that, that people recognize their value and, and were humbled that we could help. Great. Uh, thanks, Saul. Uh, so you were, you mentioned uh, the VC money in that case uh, that uh, indeed helped with the emergency. And speaking about money, I'm switching back to Alba um, <clears throat> to ask you, about uh, the funding, right? Because uh, for any open source uh, project to, to become sustainable, it also needs to be financially stable. So, and you know that the CDIM, uh, in the CDIM we have what we call a public common partnership, meaning that we have a big public investment behind the project and we also have uh, our community who manages the project from the very beginning. But in your view, Alba, what, what other funding sources uh, can a project like the CDIM 
consider in order to ensure its sustainability beyond the contributions from public institutions? Well, I don't know if I'm the most suitable person to uh, address this question because uh, the Foundation for Public Code, we consider ourselves a, uh, a non-partisan, uh, a non-lobbying organization. So we, let's say that we don't get into business models, uh, if, if uh, I can put it like that. But uh, we only, for instance, work with, uh, yeah, we only work with uh, <clears throat> government organizations, but I think for instance, the CDIM uh, has been doing it very well so far, uh, working with universities, for instance. So you're also diversifying by, by doing that. Also, I don't know, or even getting contributions for, from both individuals and organizations. So I think that's a, a pretty, pretty interesting technique. I think Consul also did something similar back in the days. So, hmm. yeah, I heard about some of these um, options no? that we have now, like using maybe GitHub sponsors or something like that. And we will definitely look at these other funding sources next year with our uh, association. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit also about open source communities and the different governance models that they can adopt. Uh, I'm very curious to know how the GT community works, if it's open to everyone. Jaya mentioned also uh, something about it in her presentation. And I was uh, looking around, I, I saw that you are using uh, Discords as a kind of a community forum. But uh, also in your GitHub repository, I have seen some issues labeled with, uh, for example, with feature requests. So I don't know how how this workflow works. It's we don't have, I would say, a set of rules, right? We we wing it um, because. So first of all, uh, our like GT is open to anyone to participate. Um, you can either file issues, send pull requests, join a forum. Um, and also we have a bi-weekly community call where people can ask questions, you know, request features and whatnot. Um, and we have outside collaborators, but the GT team that is working at 8 by 8 is, let's say, uh, the, the part of the team that sets the direction of the project. And this means that uh, even though we do take pull requests, uh, sorry, feature requests, um, they need to fall in the scope of, of the vision we're trying to fulfill. And that means that sometimes, even though um, some idea may, may be a good one, uh, we consider it to be not part of the core project. We are trying to keep the project, um, so we engineer it so that you can build on top of it rather than bolt everything to it a little bit. For example, uh, one of the things we, we, haven't, we haven't mentioned is that, so Jitsi is right now on its sort of third hosting company, if you will. It has started out independently in a company founded by the original founder, Emily Boff, then got acquired by Atlassian, then we got acquired by 8x8. And I don't think there's many projects that have survived two acquisitions and remained equally open source and with a thriving ecosystem. So the, the thing that allowed us to move from one place to the other so easily is because we designed the APIs, we designed how the whole thing works to plug things in and out instead of tying yourself to the Atlassian infrastructure, to the 8 by 8 infrastructure, so we can shift pieces around. And um, this means that being open source friendly is our priority. But at the same time, uh, we need to make sure that we don't end up with feature creep because uh, in open source, there is no such a thing as free code. It's free as in a free puppy. You need to feed it, take it out, like take care of it. It's, you need to maintain it as well. So that's also one of the motivating factors for creating this GT as a service platform. Like uh, there's people that have, you know, businesses around other areas that want to uh, um, have the meeting capability. Imagine like telehealth, education, etc. And what we are doing is allowing these people to worry about their problem domain 
and then inject meetings into their problem domain. We take care of the meetings, we have that expertise, and then they have their expertise and they can combine the two. Uh, but the community has certainly a huge impact in what we do in the form of, as Jay has said, we got this overwhelming feedback. I don't know what to do when I'm alone. Uh, so we fix that. And we have even gone back into some stuff we said very loud we were not going to do uh, because we still listen. <laughs> Um, for example, this view you're, you're watching right now, uh, we call it Brady Bunch mode because it looks like the Brady Bunch um, starting credits and or Zoom's gallery view, I think they call it. And we, we really didn't want to do it. Um, but then at one point, we cave in and we did it. And what we've seen during the pandemic is that we haven't seen almost a single screenshot of the other view um, when people were saying, oh, I'm meeting with all these people. So it was definitely a success in the end. Um, community wanted it, we finally went for it, and it's not great. And the same goes for uh, using uh, Jitsi on the mobile browser. Because we do have mobile apps which have a better experience, we, we had said we're not going to try to make it work on the mobile browser because we have a better experience. But it turns out that there's many people that just want to do a one-off quick call. And for that, having to download an app, install it, run it, is too big of a bar. And so then we made it work. Actually, Jay, I worked a lot on that part. And, um, and now it works. And people can use it that way as well. So uh, the input is certainly there. And we take lots of contributions also code-wise. I would say probably the biggest part where we get contributions is translations because all the internationalization that we have in Jitsi is community contributed. Yeah, uh, exactly. In the stream, we have the same um, big part of the contributions come to the translation system. I believe that the stream is available now in almost 50 languages. And this is, of course, uh, thanks to the effort to many contributors around the world that just, I mean, we did the infrastructure to enable this collaboration, but of course, it's the rest of the the people to that that helps, no, with that, with that work. And I also, I think we are very aligned in this vision on the architecture. Uh, let's say Jitsi, but let's say the Sidim. We also try to keep our core code base very small because the architecture of the Sidim is very modular. So. Uh, we also try to encourage to uh, go to this model, uh, but you know, uh, some sometimes it's a, it's a bit delicate to to draw the line and where yeah. do you accept the new contributions or not, or maybe because of the time that you were telling at the beginning, maybe it's not the right time now, but in two months will be. So. Okay, so uh, I need to control a little bit the time because we are having a such an interesting conversation that we are running a little bit out of time. Uh, but uh, let me um, ask you another question about the communities because um, I mean, when we, when we talk about open source community, it's important to talk about healthy communities and this is related to the level of diversity and inclusion and openness that a community uh, has so alba do you think that in general open source communities uh, have improved in this uh, subject in diversity and inclusion or we are still very far from the desirable scenario it's a bit tricky, this question, because yes, the answer is uh, yes, in a sense that uh, I feel that every single community, almost uh, normal ones at least, they are walking towards that, uh, that goal, that vision, and that's pretty cool. Uh, but especially, for instance, in the, in the open source uh, communities, maybe because of the, I don't know, that people can feel a, li a little bit safer, you know, behind the screen. I, 100% perceive it way more than in other physical communities uh, that, that I see that. And also, for instance, from the Foundation uh, for Public Code point of view, the code bases we work with, we, we also try to include it in our, let's say, 
recommendations when, when they start, when they uh, launch one of these code bases, is one of the first things to, to do, include the code of conduct. It's something that we try to uh, make happen and not just as a document that you know you just place here and you you know wash your hands like no everything's fine but uh yeah we also try to to pursue that that goal for sure and what about you uh jay and saul does does it have any code of conduct or any policy in this regard so at the moment we we don't actually um our community has organically grown since it was very small until right now and um i get this kind of a cop out uh but the reality is uh we haven't we haven't seen like uh, um not going to say a need but you know it hasn't been it's like with a feature request it hasn't been requested off of us we haven't had instances where we thought it would solve the problem, so it hasn't organically come up. I, I don't believe anybody would object to it. Like I participate in many open source communities that have one, very happy to participate if they have one. Um, from where I stand, I understand. Uh, I am, of course, part of a um, small privileged group, but I haven't never been you know, um, set aside for, for not having one. Uh, so I, I, I think I, I haven't seen all of it, um, but you know, we so far that don't be a jerk has worked. I understand that it's a bit too little sometimes, mm -hmm. but for some reason or another, uh, in our community it has worked so far. I know we have some, you know, guidelines, um, some stuff in our in our forum, for example, some some rules of the quorum, and we have had to ban people. Uh, this happens uh, on GitHub, not really, for example. Um, so everything has been a little bit calm as you are. And for now, it has worked. It, should we do some more? Likely. Uh, I think the answer to both of your questions is yes. Uh, we're better off than we, than we were, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago uh, in open source. Uh, but I think it's the continuous improvement uh, because everything changes, society changes, um, life changes. Like right now we're having this conference, you know, behind the screen, which is for example, uh, probably a lot less intimidating for many people to interact this way and it is to physically go to a conference and stand in front of the audience and, and tell a message. Um, so we also need to, to get with the times, um, I think. Yeah, and I think it's also a matter of uh, experimentation, right? Just to um, experiment what what other formulas can work. Uh, for example, here in the CDM, uh, we we used to have like uh, what we called meta CDM labs, and they were like um, academic uh, seminars to do some research on some topic related to the CDM, and we had one related to. Uh, the gender perspective, building a platform with a gender perspective. And we found that, for example, our contributor base uh, in GitHub was, uh, I mean, we only had like uh, three uh, female contributors from a total of uh, 70 or 80 uh, developers. So we launched an initiative this year to engage more uh, women developers and non-binary gender people to participate and uh, um, using some uh, grants system just to allow them to learn the CDM for a few weeks and interact with the rest of the community. And now I checked yesterday and we are having more than 15 uh, female developers now participating. So there wasn't a problem because I think uh, our community is quite friendly. Uh, when you compare with others, you realize that yours is really uh, nice people there. But maybe it's just um, what I was saying, you know, a matter of experimenting and see what do you can achieve. Open yeah, the doors. And if I may, something else here. Um, not only from the foundation point of, of view, but also like in my previous uh, professional experience, I've seen that uh, in some communities, I'm not saying any of the communities present here do that, but I've seen in the past that some communities, they just 
uh, adopt like a passive uh, way of approaching this problem, just waiting for these underrepresented collectives to show up. And uh, that's not how it works. You have to actually, you know, establish like a conversation with these groups, understand what's going on and why they are not feeling very enthusiastic about joining. And I don't know, you have to be a little bit more active than, you know, just waiting for them to join. Exactly. Yeah, we all, we all have homework to do uh, in, this, in this topic, I think. Uh, so uh, let's go with the last question because I don't think I have time to, I want to go uh, through the questions from the community, but a very uh, important question, at least for us, and this is more directed to Alba. Um, what do you think, Alba, um, should be the role of public institutions in supporting and promoting FLOWS projects beyond uh, the funding part? And I'm thinking now about the recently launched uh, strategy plan that the European Commission uh, released a few weeks ago, uh, where they say that they want to uh, promote open source software within their organization. Do you think this will make a difference? What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I hate being the, the you know, saying the same thing that I said before, but uh, as per our funding principles, we are non profit, a non profit and non partisan organization. But, however, we love uh, hearing about new public organizations that have chosen to use open source. And uh, in this case, um, it's pretty interesting because, first of all, it's, it's interesting to see in that document that the European Commission, uh, they highlight the clear operational benefits that, uh, that go in through this path has, right? So you can believe A or B, but you know, at least you have facts here that, that speak from themselves. So I think that's pretty, pretty cool. And uh, yeah, from the foundation point of view, I think we're, we're pretty excited uh, that this new uh, European Commission strategy encourages the, the European Commission to work more closely with, uh, with the wider uh, open source community, as well as scaling up uh, their own practice, let's see. Yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, we are also hopeful that this will have an impact. Uh, okay, they're telling me that we are running now. This is <laughs> this is the final uh, warning. We are running a little bit out of time, but I think we have time to answer at least uh, one question from the community. And to the rest that I'm going to check right now, maybe uh, you could answer um, directly in MetaDCD if you have time after the call. But uh, let's go with this first one from Oliver Acevedo. He asked uh, to the Jitsi team, I'd be curious to hear about Jitsi's ecosystem to possibly start a conversation comparing it with the CDM's own and a discussion about the challenges in handling diverse uh, demands from different stakeholders. I think we commented a little bit on that, but if you want to elaborate. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a little bit of what I said before. That, um, it, it goes down to a little bit of the governance model or, or stewardship. So we are, um, we are kind of the ones that would drive the project forward uh, for the most part, at least set the, set the direction. We have a product team, but also we are very independent. So I don't check with anyone before replying on GitHub and Jaya doesn't either um, because I, I think we're a small enough team and we are more than that, we are actually very like-minded. Um, we have the GTC vision of things. So, uh, but when we don't know or when in doubt, we kind of ask around. And that's a little bit how we, how we set the line. But as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the line will, will stay that way because many things happen, you know? Uh, we were like a bit over two years ago, we were part of a different organization and suddenly one day you get called into a meeting and you're told you're leaving. And then something else happens and uh, you find yourself uh, um, taking a slightly different direction or suddenly you find yourself fixing, like dropping projects that you were super passionate about to fix your new passion, which is keeping the infrastructure alive. So I think it's important to have some guiding principles, but at the same time, keep yourself nimble and flexible so that 
um, whatever happens, you can quickly um, and adapt and overcome. Is if we take a look at Jitsi's past, for example, if they started out as a PhD candidates um, project that did multi-party, sorry, multi-protocol messaging on the desktop, right? Uh, then fast forward some years, WebRTC came and turns out that th that thanks to that technology, you, you could bring this part to the browser and suddenly make it available to a much broader audience. So again, the guiding principle was, oh, let's do this, but suddenly, wait a second, this thing disrupts our industry as it did. And it's important to recognize these factors and, and move forward with them. Uh, piggybacking on one of the last things that Jaya mentioned, end-to-end -end encryption. Um, we hold the, well, we're very happy to say that we are the first to implement the end-to-end -end encryption by using um, the APIs that uh, Google built into Chrome, like the minute they were available. And uh, well, why? Well, because people wanted this, they, they needed this, some people need this, and some people want this, someone needs it. And uh, we went for it. Um, and, and, and that's what we do, you know, did we have in our roadmap end-to-end -end encryption? Hell no, but suddenly it becomes feasible. So we jump on it. And, and that's sort of how we do. We, we don't have a, a, a 10 year master plan on a binder. <laughs> no, we, uh, um, we, we see, we test, we adapt, we overcome, uh, we maintain, and we keep ourselves light and flexible. And maybe that's your secret sauce to, to become successful with, with the project. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid we're going to end uh, the call here. Uh, it's been a really a pleasure to have this conversation with all of you, um, Alba, Jaya, Saul. Um, we've learned a lot from your experience and your insights. And um, we hope to, to we can meet uh, someday in person and not only through this really cool uh, uh, platform. So <laughs> yeah, congrats, thanks for having on, us. congrats on everything uh, you're doing and keep up the great work. Yeah, likewise. Thanks a lot for yeah. having us. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Carol, and thanks for thanks. having us. And thank you to everyone who joined us for this session. Uh, we're going to leave it here uh, for today. I hope you all enjoyed all the keynotes and sessions we had in this first day of the Sivin Fest. We're going back tomorrow at 10.30 uh, CET time with an interesting technopolitical panel on participation and research. So don't miss it and see you there. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks.